Uh, this is part one of two. Uh, so you have to come back next week to catch the end of it. Also, uh, I forgot to mention dinner church. Uh, we had a fantastic time at dinner church on Wednesday. Like the church was the church, people. Um, and so we're going to be tackling Revelation for the next two Wednesdays as well. So come on out uh, if you're able. So yes, this is part one of two. If I had a quarter for every time someone has asked me over the past 14 years to preach a series on Revelation, I think I'd have enough to buy a cauliflower in this economy. Maybe even two. If you haven't had to buy groceries for a little while, last time I checked, a cauliflower was going for about $7. It's insane. Come, Lord Jesus. There is definitely an interest in the church about this mysterious final book in the Bible. Perhaps you have read it and are mystified by all of the images, like the horsemen of the apocalypse, the seals and bowls and lampstands, oh my. Uh, there's a dragon and a lake of fire, uh, the redacted of Babylon. I was going to say it, but there are children in here. Uh, the Antichrist, and there's blood. There's blood all over this book. Uh, so much blood. And on and on. So it's pretty fantastical stuff. Then again, perhaps you haven't read it, but you've been privy to a conversation where a relative or neighbor is spouting off about the end times, its imminence, and how all the signs are lining up. I had a great aunt and uncle who for years, I have to try and say this with a straight face, who for years um, sent a lot of money to televangelists, most notably the infamous Jim Baker. After they died, it was discovered that they had stocked up their little apartment with purchases of evangelical survivalist food. Apocalypse chow. Mm -hmm. Not Google it. Buckets of freeze-dried meals with expiration dates set for decades after their production. Food for the last days, you know. This is assuming, of course, that you had access to water and a filtration system for that water, which you could also purchase through Jim Baker's website. This latter category of Revelation enthusiasts believe that the last book in the New Testament is a compendium of prophecies and predictions about how the end of the world is going to play out. Okay, so church, I'm going to show you my hand, uh, just so you don't have to wonder for the next 15, 20 minutes where I stand on the matter, and I notoriously do not have a poker face, so you've probably figured it out. While yes, yes, I did devour the famous Revelation-based book series Left Behind in the early 2000s, I do not, in fact, believe that the book of Revelation itself is a playbook for the end of the world. I understand it is a hot topic for people, especially these last few years with the pandemic and wars and rumors of war and such. But if it were true that the book of Revelation is intended as a guidebook to the end days, you'd think that a great deal of seminary training for ordained ministry would be devoted to translating and understanding this vital book. The truth is, it gets a very understated tip of the hat in academia and is bundled with the books of Daniel and Ezekiel and parts of Isaiah as a literary genre that begs to be dealt with within its historical and social context. I'm sorry to tell you, but the book of Revelation is not a crystal ball predicting the world's future. Come on Wednesday to fight me about it. Nevertheless, uh, in the love of Christ, don't worry, uh, Wednesdays are not Fight Club. We don't speak about Fight Club. Nevertheless, people have asked me time and time again for a series on the book of Revelation, believing the person in the pulpit can make sense of the mysteries of the return of Jesus Christ and the end of the age. I can't blame them. The book opens with the words, 
the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all he saw. And then the book ends with the words, Amen, come Lord Jesus. Surely I am coming soon. I understand why we might readily assume that the intervening chapters would explain how we get from A to B. Dispensationalism, a theological approach to understanding scripture and how God works in the world. Okay, that's your $10 word for today, by the way dispensationalism. Uh, It emphasizes the literal interpretation of scripture and the precision and reliability of prophetic prediction. Naturally, many evangelicals and fundamentalists find uh, this method attractive. Yet, it is not universal. Neither is it a long-held theological framework. Dispensationalism really only took shape in the mid-19th century hasn't been around very long. It is not a theology that we adhere to in the Reformed tradition. Instead, you'll find many in our thread, the Presbyterian or Reformed uh, thread of the Christian tapestry, choosing a more symbolic interpretation, understanding all the players and characters and events in the book as metaphor or allegory, nothing to take too seriously. But this also leaves something to be desired. Why? Because if it was only symbolic, then what power would it have held for its first listeners? And what power would it have to survive the millennia and make it to our world today? No, it has to be something more than just symbol or story. It has to be a secret third thing, something eclectic, perhaps. A professor of mine at Knox College recently published a book, I brought it with me, called After Dispensationalism, Reading the Bible for the End of the World, Light Reading. In it, actually he's hilarious, in it he suggests that like Ezekiel and Daniel, Revelation meant something to its original audience, something concrete. Much of the book had to be understandable and immediately relevant to those who first encountered its message. But that's not all. Throughout the book of Revelation, repeated appeals uh, to off-scene biblical numbers and images from the Old Testament, which suggests that the author is heavily invested in communicating his message through symbolism. So it's both and. Yet... The final chapters of the book, with their full and utter destruction of Satan and death and Hades, and the translation of the faithful to a new heaven and a new earth, well, that suggests that part of Revelation awaits fulfillment at the end of time. So when it comes to reading the book of Revelation, we would be wise to adopt an eclectic approach. This is definitely not a one-size hermeneutic fits all situation. So be very careful, lest you find yourself ordering apocalypse chow from televangelists online. Our scripture reading this week and next week are from the tail end of the book of Revelation. There are no more wars, there's no dragons, uh, there are no battles. This is the happy part. I guess you could say. Contrary to popular apocalyptic thinking, there is no rapture here or a future snatching of Christians up from the earth. Instead, it is God who is raptured down to earth to take up residence among us. If you've been around Knox for a while, you'll recall me using the metaphor of escalators. I always picture the ones uh, at Mapleview Mall that go up to the food court, up and down from the food court. I don't know why. Those are just the ones. Christians thinking that at the, end of the t- at the end of time, they go up to heaven while God is on the other one coming down the escalator to earth, wondering where we think we're going. God is moving in here. This earth is not destined for destruction, but for renewal. God is moving in here. 
Which brings me to this point, the Greek. It always comes back to the Greek, doesn't it? The Greek word used for new earth in Revelation 21 verse 1 can mean new. It also means renewed. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean a different earth. There is no justification for using up the earth on the grounds that we get to trade this one in for a new and a bigger one. This is the one God seeks to redeem and renew and inhabit. I remember certain relatives saying it doesn't matter if we cut down all the trees and poison all the oceans because God's going to make a new earth anyway. That's not what scripture says. This is the one that God seeks to redeem, renew, and inhabit. That should cause us to take stock, shouldn't it? Where are my environmentalists in here? I know, Connie, it's right there. But she's not the only one. God wasn't kidding in Genesis when God said that we're called to be stewards, caretakers of creation. We are house-sitting people, and frankly, we're not doing a great job of it because God is coming back, and God is taking up residence here. But even if we don't talk about the climate crisis this morning, which we ought to and we will eventually, Look at the other ways that this renewed earth is described. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. See, says God, I am making all things new. We have to consider two things. First of all, these were powerful words 2,000 years ago for people struggling to follow Jesus in the shadow of an oppressive Roman Empire. But these are powerful words for us today, too. Not because we are in the shadow of a powerful, oppressive empire. In fact, we're part of it, sadly. But because they remind us whom we serve and what the end goal is. Restoration, peace, and God dwelling here. These last images in Revelation 21 and 22, they help us recommit our loyalty to God and not this world. And I don't mean this world as in the water and the trees. I mean this world as in the empire, the powers and the principalities. Our loyalty is with God. Not because this world is lost and worthless, but because it is God who is going to redeem it. If that's what we believe. If that's what we believe. Think about the escalator again. Have we held too long to the view that we're heading out of here? What happens if we remember that God is coming to us here? What we believe affects how we live. At least it's supposed to. That is a very simple way to understand the work of theology. If we believe God is redeeming this world, then it is meant to direct how we live in this world today. God calls us into partnership as far back as Genesis 12, 12, someone said 12 and it wasn't David, thank you. Wow, 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 wow. Was it Rach Goldstar? Slow on the uptick, Platt. That's okay. God calls us into this partnership as far back as Genesis 12. I will be your God, you will be my people. Do you hear those echoes in Revelation 21 and 22? I will be your God, you will be my people. I will bless you, here's the game plan, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing then to all the nations of the world. That theme carries throughout scripture right through to Revelation, right through to the fulfillment of time. If we believe 
that God is going to eliminate tears and injustice and pain and hunger and death, then what exactly is stopping us from participating in that work today? In fact, should anything be more important than this work of redemption and renewal? Should we not be living in a way that is a foretaste of the new heaven and the new earth? Dispensationalism says win souls for Christ so that when the rapture happens, you can get to heaven. Scripture says God is coming here. Let's start living that way now. And showing people what it looks like when we wipe every tear. When we feed every hungry belly. When we fight against injustice. Should we not be living today in a way that is a foretaste of the new heaven and the new earth? The book of Revelation is not an escape plan. It is the work we have today. Today. Because God's kingdom has already broken in. And it is already being made manifest. See, God says, already I am making all things new. To God be all the glory. Amen.